I write essays giving my take on life. Human nature is too complex to be diagrammed like a simple sentence. Good essayists recognize, Arthur Benson wrote, that most people's convictions are not the result of reason, but a mass of associations, traditions, things half understood, phrases, examples, loyalties, whims. The perceptive essayist must care more about the inconsistency of humanity than about its dignity, and he must study more what people actually think than what they ought to think about. My words are not hot and sharp. Nothing I have written has bettered or worsened a long-lasting abuse. I have enjoyed a comfortable life, and I rarely write fervently about social matters. The advice to praise the baker whose bread one eats strikes me as sensible, although the shelf life of many loaves is short, and some sweet rolls are too bitter for my palate, while others sit lumpy under the heart, causing intellectual indigestion. The young die good because they haven't lived long enough to be corrupted. Life is viral and messy, and all people my age have a few smudges on their hands and consciences. Prayer, as the saying puts it, doesn't stuff sausages or scrub the kitchen sink. My paragraphs rarely startle readers. Still, I know many peculiar things, such as the location for the retreat for the religious insane in Alabama, and why turtles rarely reveal secrets. Chicken rustling is epidemic in Tennessee, and last summer in Tracy City, I talked to a farmer who believed chickens should be registered like dogs and have tags stapled to their wattles. My material comes from anywhere and everywhere. At dusk in stores on Christmas Eve, I climb through the low hills rising above the Beaver Meadow and the Fenton River. Deer bounded through trees, their hooves clacking on the granite till. Rabbits hurried muffled across paths. For a while, the only sound was that of my boots crushing leaves frozen and buckled by ice. <clears throat> Then two clamors of Canadian geese flew over the trees, the noise not discordant as I usually thought it, but warm-hearted, the loud bark of chaffering. Beyond the topmost branches of white pine, the moon suddenly swelled into sight, melted and deeply yellow. I stared into the sky for a long time. I watched the yellow spread like pollen against the blue-gray night before the dark hardened forcing the glow back into the moon. Christmas is the thoughtful and melancholy time. I always miss my father and mother and the small children I have known and loved, not simply the children Francis, Edward, and Eliza were when they were young in stores, but the various children I have been. Sammy in the Sower Grave apartment in Nashville, walking with his cat Winky on a leash, a ragamuffin little boy scampering barefoot and suntan through woods in Virginia, his face streaked like that of an Indian, the war blood milk from a long scrape on his arm. Poetry, Robert Frost once said, is a momentary stay against the confusion of the world. For me, essaying is a better stay. Moreover, it is good fun. I've taught English in universities for 43 years. Teaching English, I think, is a joy, not work. I also believe that despite the palaver describing process and critical methodology, classroom success depends upon personality. Even on the dreariest, rain-scoured day, teaching has jump-started my affections. My grandmother, Tiffany, recounted this past spring suffers from dementia and is in a nursing home. For two years, my family has visited her every week. For 12 months, she told my father she wanted a pet monkey. Finally, Daddy brought her Fred, a stuffed monkey. Grandmother carries Fred with her everywhere she goes. Once, she lost Fred in the nursing home. She was terribly upset, but Daddy told her not to worry and explained that Fred had gone to Florida for a vacation. 
actually Fred had slipped off of grandmother's walker and been picked up by Henry, another nursing home resident suffering from dementia. Henry took, Henry took Fred to his room and stayed there until a nurse found him. Daddy, my student wrote, took Fred back to grandmother. Doesn't he have a fine suntan, Daddy asked grandmother, <laughs> adding that Fred lo really looked rested and healthy, all that orange juice. Fred told me he really enjoyed his vacation, but he missed you more, Daddy told grandmother, and she smiled and hugged Fred. Pretty hard to beat that, really. I write about my quotidian life, how nice it is to have my past on paper. Daddy, my daughter Eliza, said when she was five, you're the best daddy in the whole wide world. That may have been the high point of my life, actually. Last month, my wife Vicki said, you know, Sam, you're the only Southerner I have ever liked. <laughs> I'm the only Southerner I ever liked, actually. But that's another matter. I write about the small and the domestic, things that enrich ordinary living. Vicky's in my kitchen is, is drab and little. The cabinets look like stale mustard and have not been painted since we bought our house 29 years ago. Stuck to the fronts of the cabinets, however, are a score of three-inch square pink papers. Scrolling black like ornamental stenciling across the papers in Vicky's handwriting are contracts. I, Sam Pickering, <laughs> a contract typically states, Promise I will not sneak the chocolate ice cream without Vicky's permission. After the word signed appears my signature and then the date. Alas, I am not dependable, contract or not. To the, tub, to the top of a tub of ice cream, Vicky invariably sticks another square of paper, <laughs> this blue. Printed on it is the command, hands off, stay away, Sam or steady on, Sam. If I should so forget myself and forge ahead and open the tub, I will find another piece of paper. <laughs> this one reading, have you no shame? <laughs> now, when my page is bogged down, I quote other people. To die for an idea, H.L. Mencken wrote, is unquestionably noble but how much, much, not much nobler it would be if men died for ideas that were true. Searching history, I can find no such case. All the great martyrs of the books died for sheer nonsense, often for trivial matters of doctrine and ceremonial, too absurd to be stated in plain terms. That will knock somebody back. When Bernard Levin asked the great novelist V.S. Naipaul if he'd been born in Trinidad, Naipaul answered, I was born there, yes. I thought it was a great mistake. <laughs> now, I quote all sorts of things. I make the quotes up, but I say they appear in magazines and newspapers. Recently, the travel section of the New York Times ran an article describing ways to save money traveling. The most economically effective suggested buying a hot air balloon and a telescope. Inflate the balloon, the article instructed, right upward four or five miles and remain stationary while the Earth rotates. Use the telescope to study the ground. When a prime destination, say Palmyra or Samarkand, appears below, release air from the balloon, descend, <laughs> and visit for a spell. I lie all the time. All generous minds have a horror of what are commonly called facts, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote. They're the brute beasts of the intellectual domain. Who does not know fellows that always have an ill-conditioned fact or two which they lead after them into decent company like so many bulldogs, ready to let them slip at every ingenious suggestion, convenient generalization, a pleasant fancy. I'm also fond of puns. I read an article in The Entomologist I told Vicki last week that I think you'll like. The article described albino insects that were active out of doors during the day. I've never seen any albino insects, Vicki said. 
They're common, I said. If you walk across the pasture behind Horse Barn Hill, you'll notice them. They often flock together beneath the great ashes. Books are like eye drops and clear one's vision. So before the walk, read a dropper of nursery rhymes especially the one describing Mary's little lamb whose fleas were white as snow. <laughs> now, I also write about my present life, aged people. People my age don't have many regrets. We know the past is unchangeable, and with the gall at the gate, if the, wor the word if disappears from our speech. If a wag said, demonstrating the bootless use of if, if your grandfather had been a woman, he would have been your grandmother. <laughs> no man over 70, of course, capable of appreciating the wreck that he has become, takes himself or indeed life seriously. For folks like me, the absurd is especially appealing. Frank Sullivan's quoting an acquaintance in a, rock, in a book entitled A Rock in Every Snowfall, Snowball, for example. Here's the quote, I may be wrong, but I'm not far from it. Amid the inconsistencies, the paragraphs, all the meanings that don't mean a hoot in life, I think stories are constant, and I tell lots of stories. They're sent to me by readers. Most of the ones I receive are old stagers and describe the familiar doings of nitwits or tricksters. Typically, a sheriff has just slipped a hood and noose over the head of a bank robber when a fire erupts in a church at the far end of town. The sheriff, his deputies, the hangman, and all the picnickers and kibitzers race to the fire, leaving the robber alone on the gallows. A nitwit then appears and climbing the steps to the gallows asks the robber what he's doing. I'm working. I get paid $5 a day to stand here and wear this <laughs> hood and noose. Five dollars just for standing there and wearing a costume, the nitwit exclaims. That sure beats chopping wood. I wish I had a job like that. The job is yours if you want it, the robber responds. Just untie my hands and I'll fix you up. Fix you up. After the nitwit loosened the hands, the robber removed the noose and hood from his own head and placed them on that of the nitwit, saying, Stand here, don't say a word, and at the end of the day, you'll receive five dollars. After putting the fire out, the crowd returned to the gallows. When the nitwit refused to say any final words, the hangman pulled the lever on the trap door and the nitwit dropped through the gallows to the drown below. The nitwit had already freed his hands and was pulling the hood off when the sheriff and the hangman crawled under the gallows to fetch the body. To hell with this job, the nitwit said, tossing the noose into the hands of the sheriff. If you fellas ain't careful, somebody's going to get his neck broke. <laughs> I guess I got one more story and then I'm going to quit and that'll be it. I'm particularly fond of Genesis stories. Uh, recently I learned the origin of the phrase, so a tail bear. Mr. Bear, the story recounted, had met every animal in the forest except man. When the other animals heard that bear wanted to meet man, they tried to dissuade him. Squirrel and rabbit said Mr. Man was always accompanied by a pack of dogs when he entered the woods. Shucks, Mr. Bear said demensively, dismissively, dogs are nothing. If they approach me, I'll sweep them aside. Dogs are not the worst thing, Raccoon said. Sometimes Mr. Man carries a lightning rod, and if he has his lightning rod when you see him, turn around as fast as you can and run away. I am the king of the forest, Mr. Bear replied. Nothing frightens me. Three days later, the animals decided to have a picnic at a nearby spring. When they got to the spring, they found Mr. Bear sitting in a pool, the water above his haunches. What in the world happened to you, Raccoon asked. Did you meet Mr. Man? Yes, and he had the light, his lightning rod on his shoulder, Mr. Bear answered. When the dogs ran at me, I brushed them away just like I do bees when I find a honey hole. But then Mr. Ban, Man pointed his rod at me. It thundered, and lightning hit a tree beside me, filling my ass full of splinters. And I've been squatting in this freezing water for two days, and my backside still burns. Well, when I read this little talk to Vicki, she said, holy cow, I think I must be married to a preacher. 
Maybe I said, maybe a gentleman sinner would be better. By the way, did you see the ad in the Willamette Chronicle yesterday advertising Hosmer's oleum for piles? Used by the best and most refined people in Connecticut. <laughs> I don't believe that was in the paper, Vicky said. Yes, yes, it was in the paper, I said. I saw it there. I never lie.